Okay, well, the first thing I'm going to start with is that clearly there's a typo in the first word, which I did fix, but I've realised I fixed it after they've been uploaded. And so I am going to caveat this with done is better than perfect. And I think that is the moral, that is one of the things that I live by. So um, most definitely obesity is not a truer response, it's a trauma response. And that's going to be the, the topic of my talk today. So um I know, yes, some of you don't know me, but for those of you who don't, I just thought I would introduce uh, some of my credentials and also some of my disclaimers. Uh, so I'm a medical doctor, uh, trained as a general practitioner, and then went on to train as a lifestyle medicine physician. Uh, I also have extensive training in psychological medicine and am accredited for level two focused psychological strategies. I uh, am a member of the Australian Society of Psychological Medicine, have a certificate in medical hypnosis and practice trauma-informed care. I'm intensely interested in the metabolic health and also the psychological factors that, are health, that affect health. As a disclaimer, I run Real Life Medicine with my gorgeous colleague, Dr. Mary Barson, and we provide uh, online health and weight loss programs centered around low-carb medicine, uh, but also psychological medicine. <clears throat> uh, and this is us. So that's me standing in my actual kitchen, which is looking a lot tidier than it does in true life, uh, with the gorgeous Dr. Mary surrounded by one of our pillars, which is, of course, low-carb real food. So we know that for permanent health and weight loss, there are two, two tools, two factors, really, and they are to understand the physiology, which is that whole... Uh, aspect of low carb medicine that comes around understanding your insulin resistance and implementing all the things that will improve insulin resistance. But we also really need to understand our psychology so that we can then take our knowledge and implement it. So there are plenty of people out there, and maybe you're one of them, who understands all of the things. You've done lots of reading, you know why low carb nutrition is helpful why intermittent fasting is helpful, why going to bed early is helpful, but yet you don't necessarily do these. So we're going to explain some of the reasons why that happens today. So one of the things is we definitely need to understand our beautiful brain. When we understand it, we can work with it rather than railing against it. Everybody's brain has these things. We have default settings. We move away from pain and we lean into pleasure. That's normal. It has served us very well in human race. It has kept us safe. It has made us feel better and it has contributed to the evolution of the human race. If we didn't move away from pain and danger, then humans would not be who we are today. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go through a couple of things about the brain and just explain Exactly. We, this is this is not an extensive brain lecture, okay? So, you know, there are people called neurologists who do dozens of years of training to completely understand the brain. But what I want to do is just highlight three particular components that are really useful in understanding why we do what we do. So we've got our cortical brain, which is the brain on the outside here. And I'm hoping that you guys can see my arrow, but it is a big, big part of the brain here. Now, at the front of this, on this side, so this is where our forehead, sort of our forehead area is, we have a thing called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is what Mary and I like to call our parent brain. So it's the rational brain, it's the analytical brain, logical brain, it does impulse control, and, oops, sorry, and it does conscious it's the conscious thinking brain so it's the bit when you can think of your thoughts that they're occurring in that part of it I like to describe this brain as the bit of the brain that does things like book dental appointments so even though you know you don't really want to go it does it anyway so it really looks after the body as a whole in amongst all of this we have this bit in the middle which is what we call the limbic system, it's our emotional brain. Now, it comprises of three parts of the brain, something called the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the nucleus accumbens. So the hip, the amygdala, <coughs> oh, excuse me, still got leftover of my cold. The amygdala is the part of our brain that is looking, looking for threats. 
So it really is one of the emotional centers and it responds to threats. So it tells the body what to do if there's a situation where it feels like it's in danger. It's really useful, very, very useful part of our brain kept us safe for, you know, millennia. The hippocampus sounds like a Harry Potter creature. It is actually the part of our brain that stores memory around emotions. So it's the part of the brain that remembers when you were a bit frightened or remembers when you felt guilty or remembers when you felt happy. It's a very useful part of our brain. And then the nucleus accumbens is the bit of the brain that is very intrinsically linked with our reward center and where the dopamine receptors go. So you may have heard people talk about dopamine. Dopamine is our feel-good hormone. It, um, and we have receptors in the nucleus accumbens that sort of accept the dopamine. That then floods us with feeling good. Um, so it is intrinsically linked to the feeling good. So remember when I said our brain's job is to keep us safe and make us feel better? This is what the limbic system does. It's a quite a, a more primitive part of our brain, but at its core, that's its two functions. We call it the toddler brain. And part of the reason for, for that is <clears throat> most toddlers don't have a very well-developed prefrontal cortex, i.e. the parent brain hasn't developed yet. So its function is to keep them, keep them safe and make them feel better. And then this bit of the brain I love. I love talking about this bit of the brain. This is what's called the reticular activating system. It lives in our brain stem. Now, it's really important because it's the filter. So it filters information because if you can imagine, our brain gets so many signals, everything from what we see, hear, feel, touch, everything comes through and the reticular activating system decides is this useful to my human? If it's not particularly useful, it, it basically filters it away. So it gives us what we call our cognitive bias. Now, the problem with this is it makes us believe what we've always believed. So if you have always thought that you're unlucky, let's just say, okay, I'm making up a belief, I'm unlucky. You, you, your brain will filter all the information to come into that to confirm that and it will disregard anything that counters that. It's very, very tricky. It's quite powerful and it's really important to know about it because otherwise what happens is we get stuck in believing what we've always believed and I'm going to go through that a little bit more, a bit, bit more detail. What I want to talk to you about today briefly again is trauma and what exactly trauma is and how it affects our brain. So there is something called the ACEs. The ACEs are adverse childhood experiences and they're, li they're listed as these. So anything that is considered physical abuse or physical neglect, sexual abuse, psychological abuse or neglect, witnessing family violence, family members with drug or alcohol addiction, family members with severe mental illness, family member in jail, and parental separation or divorce. These are all considered ACEs. So parental separation is an A score of one. And we know that the more ACEs a person has experienced, then the higher their trauma response. But there's also something that we call small t trauma which is not the big, you know, things that everyone would consider to be a trauma, but they are really more about unmet childhood needs. So children, children are, <laughs> children are designed, and again, humans are nurturing creatures. We're mammals and we're meant to nurture our young. Now, for some of us, we may have had a childhood where we weren't validated or where we didn't feel heard. Or we learned that love perhaps was conditional on being good. We may have learned that expressing emotions isn't safe. <clears throat> and for many people, they learned that other people's needs are more important than their own. 
So whilst we would all recognise big T trauma, small T trauma, which is this, and again, it's not a one-off episode. It's not a one-off episode of somebody saying something mean to you. This is ongoing, so it'll be a repetitive pattern. And what that does is it develops the way our brain thinks and sees the world. We know that 40, there is a 46% increase in the odds of an adult developing obesity. This is if we've factored for everything else based on their exposure to multiple of those adverse childhood experiences. And I'm just going to go through a little bit today on why that might be the case. So <clears throat> what we've discovered, okay, you've heard about the brain, we've heard about the prefrontal cortex being the logical parent brain that makes rational decisions and is in charge of impulse control. And we've heard about the emotional brain, the amygdala in particular, that is looking for threat, looking to understand why, uh, what we need to do to keep us safe and also the nucleus accumbens in here, which is the reward centre that is designed to make us feel better. So what we know in the brains of people who have had trauma is that the nucleus, the, sorry, the amygdala in particular is much bigger. It's much more active. It's on the look for threat all the time. And this is because child, children who either had big or small T trauma felt unsafe. So they felt unsafe in childhood and therefore their amygdala is always looking for threat and to understand why they may or may not feel safe. People who've had trauma learnt that they are not acceptable for whatever reason. Again, thinking about it, and I've got a couple of stories to tell you about this further on. But they learned that for whatever reason, they were, the way they are isn't good enough. So therefore, they have a heightened fear response. And for many of them, they become disconnected from their emotions. So they don't actually know what they're feeling because expressing emotions wasn't safe. Now, the second part of this puzzle is that for a lot of people, they felt, they thought that to become more acceptable, how can I be more acceptable? Well, our society values aesthetics. So they thought or they think, and, and you don't even have to have had trauma to think this, but by being more aesthetically perfect or pleasing, that you will then be more acceptable. And so we will use, in the past, dieting as a method of that. So trying to shrink our bodies to be more acceptable. So the people who have had trauma learn, though, that change can make them feel unsafe as well. So there's this double quandary of wanting to improve, but change feels scary. These are the common fears. These are the common fears for everybody who's making changes. They are just heightened in people with trauma. So people with trauma have exactly the same experience as the people without trauma, just often bigger. So you can have had all of these and not have had trauma, but if you've had trauma, they are likely to be magnified. So people have fear of judgment. Okay, and I'm sure you've all had this fear of standing out. So that idea of when you're, you're you know, trying to pick foods that suit you when you're in a crowd and people start commenting on your meals. We've got fear of missing out. Again, our brains are like the idea of feeling good. And for many of us, food makes us feel better. We've got fears of being difficult. You know, nobody wants to be that person. That person who then says, I, 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 I'm I, not eating bread. And so again, that can make us feel very vulnerable and exposed. We've got fear of failure. So again, if you've done many attempts at trying to improve your health or lose weight and you've, you know, failed by whatever standard that is, the idea of trying again when your reticular activating system, that bit of your brain that makes you believe what you've always believed is telling you it's not going to work and it filters information to confirm that. We have fear of success and this is common in trauma people because being in a bigger body is very protective. Being in a bigger body can make us feel invisible, 
nobody comments on it. When you start to lose weight, people comment and they start saying things like, oh, you're looking good. And that can, for a lot of people, can be very, very scary. Uh, we have fear of hunger. Okay, lots of people who have done dieting used hunger as a, uh, I guess, a tool to confirm that they must be losing weight if they're hungry. We've got the fear of never being able to eat something again. And we've also got the fear of putting all the weight back on. So when we have that as our biggest driver, then our brain will say, well, don't bother trying because you're going to do all this hard stuff and it's all just going to go back on anyway. Diet culture, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because this is like a second, almost like a subsequent trauma that people who have done dieting for many, many years, often decades, will experience. Dieters are taught to use willpower and deprivation as their mindset. Dieters are taught to use guilt and shame as motivation. Dieters are taught not to care about their health, only care about getting thin. And the reason for that is that being thin makes us more acceptable. Dieters get taught these lines. Now, I am a dieter. I was a dieter. And these are some of the lines that I was taught. Pickers wear big knickers. Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Go hard or go home. The scales never lie. And it will all be worth it in the end. Now, I want you to have a think particularly about that last sentence. It'll all be worth it in the end. I cannot tell you how many times people said that. I cannot tell you how many times people still say that in various Facebook groups when somebody might put up, you know, a post saying they're struggling. People will say this, it'll all be worth it in the end. The subtext to that sentence is that what you're doing is very hard, really hard, but there's an end point, so don't worry. This is such a myth and we'll go through that as well. So I learned in Dietland two gears. I learned this, perfect, or on a bender. Ah, <clears throat> okay, so my video is not working on this particular slide, but uh, there it was a video basically of a car careering down the road of life. So that's exactly how I felt. I was on a bender or being perfect. Diet culture taught me all or nothing, but there's the two sides, it's the two sides of the same court same coin so when I was on a diet and I'm sure many of you have done this I had ironclad willpower as I said hunger for me was like a badge of honor if I was hungry I must be losing weight because it's all going to be worth it in the end I would develop this sense of virtuousness virtuosity I felt noble Every time I denied myself anything, it was like another little, um, I guess, <clears throat> penny in my piggy bank of goodness. And I often use that line of being so good, so good. The flip side of that is if I'm not then doing that, then what am I? Weak, undisciplined, lazy, greedy, bad. People would say, and I used to say that oh, I've had a bad week. It wasn't even, or even further, not just I've had a bad week, I've been bad this week. Bad. So this whole guilt virtue cycle just kept, you know, one side or the other. When we're not doing what we think we should be doing, we tend to hide. Okay, because guilt and shame, they make us retreat. Guilt and shame, as I said, are the pinnacle of diet culture. And I'm going to show you again. I'll go through that in a little bit. But it makes us hide. And so then we just retreat further and further away, disconnect from all the things and keep doing that shame cycle of eating. Diet culture teaches us this. Perfection. All or nothing. Eat all the bad food before you start on Monday. And it focuses on the scarcity mindset. So I cannot tell you the number of times I did this. Maybe not, well, probably New Year, but I could say every Monday. 
every Monday. So every weekend I would eat all the food in the cupboard because on Monday I was going to start and then I wouldn't actually start, buy more food, eat it all before the weekend and just continue this cycle. <clears throat> in diet land, I learned that the scales never lie. And what would happen is, that, and I'm sure some of you can remember this, women would line up, mainly women, okay, mainly women, it was mainly women, lining up on the scales to have somebody there and if you put on weight there was always a comment oh what sort of week have you had and when and my mum went to diet went went to diet club of various sorts and at one of her diet clubs the they would read out all the people that had gained weight they'd read out how much they'd gained and the person that gained the most would be given a badge of a pig, which they had to wear, and they were supposed to wear that for the whole week, using guilt and shame to motivate people. So incredibly destructive. And again, if you've had trauma, you already have a big dose of guilt and shame, and this diet culture just added to it. What we will often use is a tool to help that we think is going to help us and it's called and we will berate ourselves. So how many times have people woken up from the day before? So the day before they've done something, they've eaten some poor pile of food, drank alcohol, done something that they didn't want to do, wake up in the morning and just call themselves an idiot. I am such an idiot. Why did I do that? I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that. I need to do better. Okay, berating doesn't help anybody. We do it thinking it's going to motivate us, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It just makes us feel terrible. Diet culture punishes hunger. It doesn't address physiological hunger. It doesn't address the body's needs at all. It just tells you that hunger is like a character flaw. Again, you're just weak. Push through it because it'll all be worth it in the end. Go hard or go home. Nothing about actually nurturing and nourishing your body. Diet culture teaches you nothing about stress eating, boredom eating, lonely eating, reward eating. It just tells you don't do it. That's all it tells you. It gives you no tools at all. Now, <clears throat> there's lots of way in, ways in which fear disguises itself. So as I mentioned, I mentioned the amygdala, which is our response to fear. It acts very quickly. And if you have a heightened, I'll give you an example of how the amygdala, amygdala acts. So, you know, when you, maybe you're sitting down and you hear a big noise. So the door slams or something happens and your body immediately does this <gasps> before you've even had a chance to reconcile what it is. So your body is already reacted and then your brain goes, oh, it was just the door shutting. Okay, but the body has reacted as though it's a gunshot. Again, people who have had trauma have much bigger reactions to things that perhaps people without trauma wouldn't necessarily see as threatening. So it's really important to understand that. Now, again, if you're listening to this and you're a, a healthcare practitioner or a coach, recognizing trauma is really important because what it means is we don't we want to make sure we're not contributing to that person's trauma and making it worse and if you've had trauma and again it doesn't have to be big t can be little t trauma recognizing what's going on for you then gives you a different sense on what you need to do to in, to change the things that you want to change so i want to talk to you about a lady called sue so Sue was one of my patients, and that's not her real name. Um, <clears throat> I saw her. She's a 65-year-old lady. She has type 2 diabetes. Uh, so, you know, clearly insulin resistant, very metabolically unwell. Understood low carb, read all about low carb, knew that low carb worked for her. She would do it for a bit. Blood sugars would improve. We'd be able to reduce some medications. Then she just kept going back to eating and she just was so frustrated and angry with herself and was unable to articulate why she kept doing this. So we chatted and after a while I was asking her about her childhood and her family and on the surface, you know, Sue had two parents. They were divorced. She had a sibling. She had the nuclear family. She went to school. There was nothing that seemed obvious. 
And after a little while, we were talking a bit more about her family situation. And she then remembered a, me a memory of sorts. So her parents would, there was quite a lot of disagreement in the family. So there wasn't violence, but there was disagreement. And that disagreement was quite loud. So her parents would argue or fight quite a bit. And there would be a bit of yelling between the two of them. So what happened when Sue was about five is once when the parents would start yelling, she would get distressed. It felt scary to her. She would cry and her dad would turn to her and tell her to stop your snivelling. Stop crying. Stop your snivelling. Grow up. <clears throat> and so she would then just be frozen. And then she learnt that expressing her emotions wasn't safe. So what started to happen was that over time when the parents started yelling, she would run to the pantry, she'd grab a tin of peaches, she'd run outside, she'd climb a little tree and she'd hide in the tree and eat these peaches. And this was the only tool that this poor child who was five or six had, the only tools that she knew to make herself safe and to feel better. So the minute conflict came, this is what was happening. And it wasn't until we recognised that, that this was a tool that she'd been taught, well, not been taught, but had used for decades, decades. And it wasn't until we realised that she needed different tools and she needed to tell herself that she was now safe, that conflict was now different from when she was five or six, and that also to really forgive herself because all this beautiful five or six-year-old little girl had was this tin of peaches. And so when she could do that, everything shifted. Her brain was trying to make her safe and make her feel better. So she wasn't weak, she's not undisciplined, but we need to learn to work with our brain and not against it. So the thing I always say, this is absolutely not your fault, absolutely not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And what I mean by that is no one is going to come and fix this for you. Your responsibility to learn, to find out, to inquire, to ask. Now, the thing I would say is there are some things we call the wolves in sheep's clothing. So there are things <laughs> out there promising to make you feel better. Processed food would have to be one of them. Now, the way I look at processed food now, it is scientifically engineered. It's hyper palatable. It's designed to make you feel better. Absolutely designed. And then we are marketed to within an inch of our lives with promises that are false. Alcohol is sort of the same. It's maybe, I mean, it's alcohol's been around for a long, long time. But the messaging around alcohol now is that it is used to make us feel better. And I'm sure many of you have had this, where a well-meaning person after a busy day at work says to you, oh, go home, put your feet up and have a nice glass of wine, you'll feel better. You absolutely will. It is a tool. But the problem for many of us is the tool no longer serves us. The tool no longer helps us. And in fact, the tool can harm us. So what can you do about it? Well, there's a couple of things. The first thing I'd like to say is if you have had trauma, if you go, oh, oh, oh gosh, I have, then there's a couple of things. You don't have to do nothing. You don't have to just, this doesn't have to be your lot. Okay, you can go and work with a trauma-informed therapist. There are lots of things that people can do now. There's a technique called EMDR, very, very powerful, scientifically proven technique to reduce trauma's effects. Basically, Calm your amygdala down is what it does. Okay, you, there are other therapies. We, we talk about uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, something called ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, or DBT, dialectical behavioural therapy. These are all techniques that can be used by a therapist to help you improve your brain's response. Okay, you're not broken, but we need new tools. There's a couple of books that I love. This one here, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk is extremely good. And I also love this one, How to Do the Work by Nicole Le Pereira. But basically what we want to be able to do is, and, and we use, this is where coaching can be very helpful. And I know 
you're going to hear about coaching this weekend. But we use the uh, thought model, which is the basis of cognitive behavioural therapy. And basically we need to understand that our thoughts can create our feelings. And the feelings are what drive our actions and your actions are what drive your results. Now, for lots of us, we become action focused. I just need to eat low carb food. I just need to do the exercise, which will then create, you know, again, depending on what your goal is, uh, improve my health, reverse my metabolic disease, lose weight. <clears throat> so four tools we focus on in that thought model. Okay. Looking at our thoughts, becoming aware of them. Do we need to change some of them? Okay, and that that, that feels weird. You can hear what do you mean? But we'll talk about that. Learning how to regulate your feelings, really important. We talk about goal achieving. And we, of course, recommend doing it with a community because doing this by yourself can be lonely. And remembering that shame is massive in, in the weight loss world and also in the trauma world. And shame hates company. So it keeps you isolated. So that's why, why we recommend working either with a person or in a community group. So repetitive thoughts become beliefs. And in psychological terms, this is, these are called schema. A schema is a single schemata is the plural. So again, thinking about our schema develop when we're little, when we're children. Okay, and then they get built upon. So this is why we talk a lot about diet culture being harmful because it teaches us to develop harmful schema around our appearance and weight management. So the thing about schema is they're beliefs, but they're not always true. So as an example, and we talk, I talk, <laughs> a little story I tell is uh, if you believe in Santa, at, which you will when you're six or seven, yeah, absolutely he's true. He's completely true. You ask people, yes, they confirm that belief. You look around, your reticular activating system as a five-year-old or six-year-old is looking for evidence, and there's plenty of it. There's half-eaten, you know, um, minced tarts. There's half-drunk milk. There's Santas everywhere. There's letters that you can write. You can now track him on the internet. All of this stuff confirming your belief that he's true. The first time you hear he may not be true, you don't believe it. Your brain goes, no, 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 because I know of all of these things. And you might run home and ask your mum. And if you're six or seven, she'll go, oh, no, no, that's rubbish. And then she'll find some more things to confirm it for you and you'll go ahead believing it. Until you're about 11 or 12 when all of a sudden we don't want kids necessarily believing in Santa and suddenly society dismantles that schema. But for many other schemas that we have, nobody's dismantling them. We just continue to believe them and they are often as false as Santa. So the way we have to do it is we develop awareness of our thoughts. Okay, for many of us, the thoughts are there just on the, in the background on just autopilot. Becoming aware of them is the first step, noticing them, questioning them with curiosity gently challenging them and then eventually changing them to a story or a belief that serves you. So as an example, for, again, many of us, change can make us feel unsafe, okay? Coming along, doing something that can feel a bit scary makes us feel very unsafe. We can challenge that and go, okay, Understand where that comes from. That comes from my childhood or comes from when I've tried before, comes from fear of failure, comes from work out why it makes you feel unsafe and then you challenge it and then you start saying this, it is safe for me to improve my health. Okay, it might be at an added, it might be it's safe for me to lose weight. It is safe for me to advocate for myself. That becomes in you. Now, that doesn't happen overnight, but it becomes something that you start saying and then you're gently challenging your thoughts around the fear. The old belief, again, this is the dietist's belief and a lot of you will have this, it has to be perfect or it's not going to work. That was totally my belief, totally. That was why I lived in perfection. 
It's why I was happy to deny my body what it needed, because I needed it to work. I then heard this belief or this um, thought where somebody said, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And I looked at that and I liked it, but it felt a bit unsafe for me. It felt a bit scary because honestly, for me, I firmly believed that it had to be perfect or it wasn't going to work. So therefore, what about this good? But I had to gently challenge it and recognize that, well, what I was doing was either perfect or a bender. So the bender bit was what I needed to improve upon. And the only way I could improve upon the bender was to recognize, well, I can make the bender better. Like I can make the bender less harmful. I can focus on maybe when I'm on the bender, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it it could be good. So then I decided that this was helpful, that it's safe for me not to be perfect, that I will still improve even if it's not perfect. So this thought model, that's the thoughts. Again, they're just some examples, okay, and you'll be able to come up with your own ones. But feelings, again, the feelings bit. This is a feelings wheel and this, these are all of the uncomfortable emotions, like there's gazillions of them. But again, in our world, we're not always particularly emotionally literate. We don't talk about feelings, particularly if Australians don't, English don't. Americans are a bit better at it. Europeans are a bit better at it. But we are a lot of the time taught not to talk about feelings. You know, it's uncomfortable. It's embarrassing. It's, you know, nobody wants to make themselves vulnerable. So we just don't talk about them. But these are the feelings that are the most commonly associated with binge eating. Fear, guilt, shame, insignificance. So insignificance, and some of you may have had this, where you suddenly think that no one cares about you and you have this idea, well, if if no one else cares, why should I bother caring? I don't care anymore. And so then you just go and eat all the things. Resentment, another really powerful trigger, which lots of people aren't aware of, And it is when you're, basically when you have agreed to do something that you don't want to do. So for a lot of that, the heart of resentment is actually your boundaries when you didn't uphold them. And so you've actually gone and said you'll do something that you wish you didn't. And you can resent then other people who actually uphold their boundaries. And it feels awful. It's an awful icky feeling because you know it's not really kind. But So what do we do with all of these feelings that we don't like, that we haven't been taught to articulate, that we don't know what to do with? Well, we shovel them down. We numb them. We neutralise them. We eat to cover them up or we drink. Food and alcohol. It's not food and alcohol. So other people will gamble. Other people will smoke. Something that activates that reward system, that nucleus accumbens system to make us feel better. So the irony of the guilt and shame being in these top things and then diet culture using those to try and motivate you to lose weight is really, really just a great travesty. So the way I look at it is that food does make us feel better. Absolutely. I mean, remember, processed foods trying to do that? Absolutely. But it's a tool that no longer serves us. Okay, again, it's not bad. You haven't murdered anyone. You haven't killed anyone, you're not ripping off old ladies, you haven't come up with some elaborate internet scheme, but it is a tool that no longer serves you. And when <laughs> processed food for me, one of the things I like to think about, it, it is a bit like a bad boyfriend. It promises the world and delivers you nothing. Promises but leaves you feeling empty. And somebody else, uh, one of our other beautiful members, mentioned that it's a bit like the sirens of the sea. Okay, it calls you in, lures you in, but really doesn't serve you. So, again, learning emotional regulation can be really helpful. And you can do these meditation, hypnosis, learning breathing techniques, tapping. And med- a touch, touch is really powerful. Again, it has to be done safely. Uh, but even self-touch, self-soothing with, with just patting is really helpful. So, again, actions, that's the thought model. We've talked about thoughts. We've talked about feelings. We've talked about actions. Okay, so the actions have to be small because for lots of us, we have made promises to ourselves that we haven't kept. 
And then we lose trust with ourselves when we've done that. So we've all promised I'm going to be starting again on Monday or whatever, and you don't do it. And then your brain goes, well, you know, you always say you're going to do it, you never do it. So we start with small. But the thing is that lots of us do these gigantic ones that we actually can't achieve. And we stay stuck down here feeling hopeless. We don't do these little ones because they feel useless. Why am I going to bother just doing that little thing? That's not going to be good enough. It is. Believe me. It is. It is. Do little and build on it and you'll end up here at the top. So actions can be easy. Keep it simple. Okay, the build a plate formula where you pick your protein, add some veggies, add a bit of fat, add some flavour. doesn't have to be simple. You can look at recipes, okay, if you want to. They're not the key, okay, they're not, they're not, they're, they're there as a tool, but they're not the, they're not the be all and end all. Same with a meal plan. They're tools, but they're not the whole picture. Okay, online grocery, great tool, not the whole picture. Emergency food, low carb products, low carb swaps, they're all fabulous tools, fabulous actions, but not the whole picture. Even people that just focus on low carb. And that's it. They go, well, just do that. Again, missing the whole point. Azempic and gastric surgery, I won't go on to those, but these are, these are also tools. And I have plenty of clients, and I'm sure most of you, you know, any of the coaches here do as well, who have either had gastric surgery or using Azempic but haven't worked out how to manage their mind and stop the emotional side of their eating. So the missing link in many programs, again, in Things that promise the world, shakes, meal plans, diet plans, dieting misses the whole point. <clears throat> so these tools, cognitive reframing, okay, just changing your thoughts, emotional regulating, goal achieving. This gives you lane assist, okay? So remember now over here, my picture that's not working was careering down the road of life and now you've got lane assist where you're making these just little micro adjustments all the way along. And I was always looking for a quote, okay, and so I loved this quote because I think it's really helpful and it's also helpful for anybody that is wanting to try and change someone else, recognising this thing. If they're not willing to learn, then nothing will help them. Okay, so recognise that if you keep saying, oh, well, I just want my husband to come on board. If he's not ready, he's not ready. Okay, focus on you. If you're not willing to learn nothing will help you and if you're determined to learn nothing can stop you but one of the things I added to it was that basically unlearn we have to unlearn particularly diet culture unlearn perfectionism and learn new skills and when you do that nothing will stop you now lovelies uh if you're wanting some more info on this okay if you want to just listen if you're looking to connect with us, then real, you know, real life medicine is our platform. You can just Google that. There's all the we're on all the handles, Instagram, all that stuff. But we also have a podcast, and this is probably our proudest, you know, it's the thing we're most proud of. It is uh it's a nutrition, but it's also actually a holistic podcast. And we're really proud of the fact that it's in the top 10 in nutrition in Australia consistently, and it's the actual only low-carb podcast that's in that. Uh so go if you want to go and uh, listen to us just Type in Real Health and Weight Loss Podcast. You can listen to it on all of the podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify. Or if you don't do any of that, you can actually just listen to it on our website at Real Life Medicine. And uh, that's my talk, darling. So if I would be very delighted to answer any questions. Yay. Yay, that was amazing. Let me just drop uh, that out so I can see you. We can all see you bigger. Lucy, that was a phenomenal I've got questions, but so many questions have come through, so I'm not going to get uh, to ask. Oh. But you know, it's okay. I just had a few, I wrote down so many things that I love. The beautiful brain. I just love that. Our brain is so beautiful, and it's just that we misunderstand it, that we fight against it. And your whole talk is helping people understand it better, so we can just love it for what it gives us, which is I love it. Yeah. I love it. And the big T, little T. I think the little T trauma. I think almost all of us are walking around with some some of that. Um, yeah. And you know what, though, what I've seen, and you, I don't know if you resonate with this, but it's almost like we think it's not big enough to be a problem and something to deal with or, so, you know, it's like, oh, no, well, I had a good upbringing, so I shouldn't, you know, you know. Yeah. 
feel guilty for like having issues yeah and I think the thing is that people also don't want to acknowledge it because they think they're somehow blaming their parents but again it's not that the parents they were doing the best with what they had as well yeah so having small t trauma doesn't mean your parents are bad people no and that's the bit I think that people go oh, I want you know no, I don't want to say anything because that will make them bad. But they're not. They're not. They were doing the same, doing exactly the same. And really this is just a way for you to identify your brains and, and your beautiful, you know, childhood's brains, unmet needs and rectifying those so that you can go, okay, now I know what I need. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that understanding that we did what we did as a survival response to ensure we were loved and yeah. yeah, I mean, it's oh, it, it is such a beautiful thing to learn about ourselves. And you brought that so. Oh, I just loved it. I loved it. Oh, um, thank you, darling. Thank you, darling. So I'm going to ask a few questions that have come through. So there's a a question: How do we decide if our trauma is the kind we need some professional help with? I guess it's on how much it's distressing you. So you know, there are people who, and again, some of this is where we listen to our self-talk first so if our self-talk is constantly berating ourselves and that we haven't been able to tap into that compassionate part of our brain uh if that then certainly getting some help will be would be useful if if you've got trauma that's actually I mean, there's obvious things that people have. So some people have flashbacks. Some people have, you know, wake in the night. They can't sleep. And this can happen for decades and they just never really work out what it is. Memories can surface that we didn't, you know, that, that were hidden and that can feel a bit scary. So I often think there's, if if you're feeling that you're not able to do what you want to do with your life for whatever reason, then, then go and see, get some help. It's not going to be harmful for you to get some help. It's safe to get help. Ooh. And I think that's a bit our brains. Again, we often told, oh, my God, you know, I'm such a loser. I should be able to sort this out myself. No, no, we can't sort it ourselves. We just get some help and see what happens. Yeah, and that's actually quite a, I, I see, you know, common I suppose, trait of someone with trauma yeah. that we want to do it all ourselves, that we don't feel like we, you know, can get the help, but it's not a failure. And that brings me back to that, what you wrote, safe is, it, it's safe not to be perfect. I think that is just so, so true, you know, that we, none of us are perfect and we're all just trying to do the best we can and figure things out as we go. And But we have that illusion, don't we, that's, oh, no, they're perfect. <laughs> Yeah, oh. yeah, they've got their shit sorted, and I can't just sort anything out. And again, this is part of that shame cycle: is I should be a, I should. So the shoulds, when the shoulds come in, should is a shame word. I should be able to do this myself. Yeah, no. yeah. Um, the next question: I've had a lot of trauma throughout my life. Do I need to address and work through each one individually in order to overcome food addiction, or are there overarching strategies? That we that can help me heal from multiple traumas simultaneously. Big question. It's a big question, and I think um, at the end of it, at the, the the crux of it again, all boils down to the idea that your brain is trying to keep you safe and make you feel better. So it's, that's its job. Um, so then we go, okay, well, what are the things? Where are the situations where I don't feel safe? And you know, it, certainly things like EMDR, like it, it's phenomenally effective. Um, but it has to be done with a trained person, and the that you know that would certainly help with with a big trauma. But I think the thing that happens, and sometimes, like everything in life, we sometimes think we do the work and then it's done. But it's a bit like gardening; <laughs> it's never actually finished. <laughs> I love it. That's okay. Because that's part of the joy of life is constantly, yeah. and I do it all the time. I constantly am working out why why am I why am I thinking the way I think, and it's not done of like oh my god why are you thinking like that? No, it's done. Oh, isn't that interesting? I feel this about this. I wonder why I feel like that. And yeah, getting to the point where you can constantly just examine yourself with that beautiful self awareness and self reflection in a way that is calm and kind. And curious, I love it. I love it because it, it get that visual of yeah, you're right. And we let the garden grow. Well, it'll just take over everything, won't it? Yeah. But 
you know, that constant just caring, that love and that attention, that's exactly what we can give ourselves and that is life. That is living. It's nothing to fear. I often say, you know, it's not like we're going to get to a point in our healing where we're going to plant a flagpole and all be done with it. There's no such thing as a point like that. I know, um, but again, and we've been taught it'll all be worth it in the end. There is no end. And know, this is and then we're in the coffin. <laughs> diet culture has caused a massive problem because yeah. all of us who have done it think there is an end. And you know, yeah, it's really, really just toxic. Toxic. Um, so many comments about I love the lane assist, another great analogy. Um, the great information as always. I've been accessing your information since you started the YouTube channel. Fantastic. So much to digest. Everybody does their best on or, or want on what they know, I think that means. Best with yep. what they know. The secret is gaining knowledge that things can be substantially different, i.e. low carb, low fat versus low carb keto. Yeah, that's right. That's that part of the knowledge. And then, you know, as we know, that's a part of the, that's one part, but what do we do with that, which is where all this stuff often comes yep. up. And But it's a beautiful um, way to just learn about yourself and just learn how life is lived through through us and what can we see in that mindset of kindness compassion and curiosity um, yeah and that's really interesting because i think for a lot of people compassion is the hardest thing they feel if they're compassionate to themselves that they're letting themselves off the hook giving themselves a hall pass uh, making it too easy on themselves and so therefore they won't do that and it's interesting i just you know you know i love an analogy and i often just think about well if you're training a dog and you're teaching that dog to sit and it sits and then it stands up. You don't go, oh, you loser. I knew you couldn't sit any longer. You've got no idea. How hopeless are you? You just go, oh, you just sort of redirect, sit. Good dog. And then you reward. Good dog, good dog. We don't reward ourselves at all. You know, again, our brain goes, oh, God. It'll minimise the wins, maximise the, you know, the mistakes. And we just live in this. And then, of course, that again, if you yell at your dog all the time, what is the dog? It lives in fear. What, is, what are one of the barriers to us doing what we want to do? Fear. So, mm. yeah, it's if, if berating worked, honestly, we'd all be thin. Yeah, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? That's, that's, so, that's so true. Um, there was so much more I wrote down here. Uh, another comment here, should is a shame word. That's a bit of a light bulb moment, actually, for that listener. Yeah. That's... Um, that is a an important, yeah. I mean, I've never really thought about the should being a shame word. So how did that occur to you? Um, I don't know. It just did. <laughs> I think um, it's a really, it's a, you know, it's it's an unhelpful word, really. It's I know it's used commonly, but you know, it's a judgment word. So it's used in, you know, I should have done better, they should have done better, they should have put the bins out on time you know they it's interesting when you realize how often you use it what it actually means it's it's there's some judgment in there and you know shame is a judge shame is all about judging judging other people but judging ourselves in particular yeah and how amazing when we do start to look and do the work and notice and you know we just see all this stuff come up and it's like you know wow and then often we get struck with a bit of guilt you know, yeah. that, oh, my gosh, how didn't I see it? How And how have I been doing this to myself yeah. and others for so long? Any any thoughts on how to handle that inevitable sort of guilt that might come up? Yeah, so I think the first thing is that guilt, again, it's not a bad emotion. None of the bad, none of the emotions are bad. They're all there for a purpose. So guilt was, you know, you know, again, I don't know who actually designed us, but it's part of it is so that we can function well within a tribe and a community because that's how humans survive. We're really vulnerable without our community. We don't have wings, claws, sharp teeth. We can't run fast. So the only way the humans survived was to work in a tribe and we guilt was part of that so that you didn't just go around, you know, randomly murdering people that pissed you off. So it's not a bad emotion. It just feels uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can then take that idea about, oh, this is uncomfortable, this really is uncomfortable, but we can get comfortable and used to being uncomfortable and not have to do anything about it 
Because like all of our emotions, they go away over time. Happiness goes away. We don't try mm-hmm. and do anything. It goes. Joy goes. They all go. And then they come and they come and they go. And that we can just learn and go, okay, interesting. Always interesting. What am I do- why, why am I feeling like this? You know, do I need to feel like this? What could I do to feel better? The beautiful, rich tapestry of living. Yeah. What a beautiful place to end. Dr. Lucy Burns, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and your knowledge, wisdom, insight, all that you've shared. And uh, everyone's loved it. Love the conversation. There's just lots of love. And uh, I'm sure if people don't already follow um, you and the podcast and obviously the work you do, they will be doing that now. So such an honour. Thank you, darling. Enjoy. Hi, darling. Thank again. you. Thank you so much for having me. I, I will. Bye. Bye.